Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Maker Fair. Welcome to the cool auditorium here. Oh, that For those of you who are just sticking around, you can stay out of the sun. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Stuart Gaines. I'm with Make Magazine. And uh, we are about to go into a series of really fascinating talks uh, that connect in one way or another with Buckminster Fuller. Uh, I hope people here are familiar with Buckminster Fuller. Does everybody know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, the Greenfield built the Henry Ford Museum behind, almost directly behind me has, a, um, has one of his Dynaxion houses, which is really something I encourage you to see uh, as long as you're here for Maker Fair. Uh, but even more important, right now we get a chance to hear some, really some personal, personal odysseys that are, were inspired by, by Polar. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. My name is Bill Becker. I was fortunate enough to be one of Bucky's uh, youngest interns. And uh, I, uh, I'll be showing you some kind of conceptual stuff about the future, including outer space as well as floating cities in the atmosphere. So I hope you'll hang on. We'll, we'll get very much into this. But one thing I wanted to do for the younger people in the audience, because this whole fair is really about hands-on. It's about getting things into your hands that really you find interesting, and then using that as an experimental base. Well, this mentor of mine, Mr. Fuller, was very much into that. In fact, we would uh, please him tremendously when we could bring him uh, fun stuff or toys. A couple of the favorites were this one. This is a pulsing kind of unit that transforms. Buck Mr. Fuller was a transforming inventor. He really invented whole new paradigms, a whole new ways of thinking about things. And he would delight when you bring in something like this. It kind of looks like a pile of sticks, but when you start moving it a little bit, you'll see it can shape itself. There's kind of a cube here in the middle. You can see that these arms. Okay, so it comes out of this neutral position into a kind of a structured cube, a star. But guess what? When you go and push some of these other sticks the other way, you get it's almost its opposite. Now you get kind of a geodesic sphere in the middle with these six points sticking out. Almost the opposite. So this is very much what he would love because uh, full of surprises and it would embrace the opposite with the kind of neutral in the middle. Now one of his strongest, uh, I'll pass, this one's a little delicate, but I'll pass this one around. Maybe you've even seen this. This was uh, a very favorite structure in the museum. I'm going to try to get him back to sell them. This was uh, developed by uh, another disciple of Fuller's, uh, an inventor named Holderman. And this is the Holderman Sphere. I'll pass this around. Wow. It's really surprising. This small kind of bag of plastic. It's almost like fireworks on 4th of July. So we'll pass that around. I hope I get it back. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the things that we would do on a kind of a folk music level, I guess you'd say, or office entertainment level. But Often, the bigger issues of the day were involved with the mission of World Game, which is a, a fantastic investigative area that uh, uh, my, my, my compadre Wayne Hendricks will talk about and other things following me. My mission here was to talk about an area that I found to be fascinating that Bucky started way back in 1928. And that was this whole notion of putting wind power, wind generators, on buildings, which uh, was radical then. Actually, it's still radical now. But uh, that's part of what my mission is. Here's your microphone. Okay, microphone. Sorry. And uh, to develop this, uh, friends and family started a company in Chicago called Aerotexture International. And Aerotexture is an expression of that goal, putting aerodynamic elements or investigating buildings as an aerodynamic gathering of power, not just a wall against 
the wind. It's like most structural engineers will design the building to be a wall against the wind. Now we're looking to see how the building could be a membrane for taking the wind and bringing it in as a power conversion system. My first Eureka experience was as a, a, a very young guy. I have an older cousin who's an architect studying at Cor Cor Cornell. And on a visit to St. Louis, I had my first AHA experience in 1960 as I was just starting the uh, program in industrial design at Michigan State up the road here. And I was absolutely enthralled when I saw the, uh, the Spirosphere Dome in St. Louis still there and this whole idea of, of capturing a, a natural landscape even under snow and, and, and tremendous winds uh, under a geodesic sphere of tremendous elegance that had a waterfall in it. It was quite an exotic experience for me. And then when I got to read more about Fuller through my older cousin, I uh, was taken by these suspended buildings he called the Dymaxian buildings and, and residential structures. Here you'd have a, a concrete core structure that uh, would be based on the ground. And out of this core structure, you'd have slip forming to create a concrete core. And then you'd actually suspend the building in tension. Uh, Bucky was a sailor and uh, knew sail structures and those things very, very well. And at the top, he proposed that there'd be a vertically spinning wind generator made by a German inventor named Fechner that could supply electric power because he knew how the winds would spin around this building and then they'd be very high speed at the top. Here's other sketches that Bucky did, all in 1928, and uh, maybe 50, 80 years ahead of his time. He also pioneered ideas about buildings having natural ventilation. In fact, uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the Dymaxian home uh, house. Some people we'll say, what's that big ear thing sitting in the top? I can give you some ideas of why that's there. And it had a lot to do with Fuller experimenting with buildings, even uh, becoming like sailing ships, looking into the wind and drawing natural ventilation throughout the building. And uh, instead of having fans do that, uh, using, using the winds themselves to, uh, to clear and, and uh, enrich the interior ventilation environment. These are drawings by his wife, Anne, who was a, a very, very good illustrator. And uh, in 1932, she was partnering with Bucky and doing uh, some of these beautiful drawings, which also would feature vertical wind generators at the top and his natural <coughs> ventilation systems. This was in Fortune magazine in a day, and then pretty soon Fuller became the publisher and editor of his own magazine called Shelter, where a lot of this was featured. And here's the Dymaxian uh, house called the Wichita House in a lot of the literature. And this is this, what's that crazy ear thing up there? Um, this is part of what came out of that early thinking of this would rotate, it would turn on its axis, and it was drawing air uh, up from the bottom cooler shading area of the, of the building up through a tube, and it would circulate the winds would circulate in here and then finally go out and enjoy nature again, refreshing the interior air at a very good, pleasant level. And regular, self, it could be manually regulated for comfort. So here's some of the diagrams. You can kind of see how, imagine the winds coming here and creating a vacuum, uh, pulling out of the uh, wing, if you will, or the rudder. And that would create a vacuum here, and that would draw air in from the bottom, circulate inside, and then finally the warm, stale air would leave the building. Uh, these were made originally by Beach Aircraft, and these were beautiful, uh, literally handmade floors, and it's been uh, extremely elegantly uh, uh, restored by the museum curators and absolutely a, a wonderful piece of work. It was a tremendous effort. Uh, I talked to some of the people involved and uh, it was very, very much in difficult straits before they got it here. They brought it back more than 100% than what it originally was. If you haven't seen it, you really should go and take a look. 
Curtis Buckingham is element. He really always wanted to surround himself with these geometric shapes and forms, which I think in a way were little universes for him. They were, they were little organized spatial uh, pieces of mathematics or visual mathematics. And uh, after he'd gone through the exercise with the Dymaxion house, by 1947, he'd learned a lot and was moving on to these early geodesic dome models, which would set his reputation for the next uh, 40 years of his life. One of the big events, and not always the happiest event, but this is the pivotal uh, support for Fuller came from Henry Ford, and he helped uh, finish off the Rotunda building, which had been set up for the, for the World's Fair, as I recall, to be open, and then the, 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 the cars would be shown below. Well, he and Henry Ford had the idea that, that he would build a dome. Uh, there are elements that are still here, but sadly this dome, under uh, difficult circumstances, burned and uh, you know, brought, helped bring down the rotunda itself, which was a temporary building. But in its day, it was uh, a remarkable feat of, uh, of elegant architecture, both the rotunda uh, cylindrical building itself, and then the dome uh, on top. Where I actually got to meet Fuller face-to-face uh, -face and, and on a professional basis was in 1965. I had uh, been working uh, and going to school at Cranbrook, north of here, and a group of people were building a wooden geodesic dome they called the Basketry Dome. And I got involved with a crew that, uh, that didn't build this beautiful model. This is a model that was done, was done there before I got there. But we built the first full-scale unit, and it was a wonderful exercise that uh, we were involved in down at SIU, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And during these meetings after uh, working, uh, we'd hang out with Bucky. And in those days, he could hang out to some degree. He was still very, very busy. But he began introducing us to these principles that later uh, evolved into the world game, which got some of its official kickoffs around 1970. And these were projections uh, about how uh, Spaceship Earth and the, the clientele on board, humanity, was, uh, was going to be running into trouble and no one was watching where the ship was going. Everybody was kind of uh, uh, downstairs dancing in the ballroom and no one was really looking out for where the ship was going. So as projections back then, Fuller was uh, documenting, it got to be alarming because here population was anticipated to rise, uh, approaching 10 billion here, down uh, 2050 or so, Looks like we're on that track unless something changes. And then here was the fossil fuel uh, dominion curve that uh, also was pretty scary. And he said, yeah, you guys, you guys better watch it. Around uh, 2000 here, all sorts of difficulties are going to happen. You're going to have wars in the Middle East, and, and, and oil is going to get really uh, difficult in terms of the major powers all going after it. And we're like, yeah, yeah, OK, sure. Let's, let's have a beer and move on. Uh, we, of course, began to see this come very quickly in the first oil uh, crisis in 73 and then in 79. And uh, that's when all the, all the presidents were saying, we have to get off oil, but of course, we haven't. Uh, we might have a shot at it now, but it's getting late uh, in the game and other countries like uh, the European Union and, and the Asian tigers, if you will, are way ahead of us. Uh, Stanford University, a couple years back, did a very interesting piece of international research, kind of stuff that if Bucky was around, he'd be doing. And they collected 8,000 points of, uh, of documented wind and began to assess what kind of translation that would be in terms of electric power. And uh, their first exercise said that they're without South America. They didn't have enough data to do South America. So without South America, uh, they were looking at about 72 terawatts of electricity. That's a million megawatts. And the world was only estimated to be using between 13 and 14 uh, terawatts of electric use per year. 
So here it was, tremendous resource going untapped and uh, still out there, maybe not being supported well enough. And these documents and, and, and ideas still haven't caught hold, caught hold in the major media or even by our, some of our leading politicians. But here's like seven to one wind power available without South America, it could add another whole uh, 20 percent there, and, and we're not tapping even a portion of it. And then uh, the National Renewable Energy Resources Lab uh, out of uh, uh, Colorado began to document winds in the U.S. This is actually a, an older chart, and I got to get a more updated one. But here out in the Midwest, uh, where you used to think there was there was no wind out here, some of the most tremendous winds here are in the Great Lakes. The darker the color, the higher the wind speed per year on average. So yeah, we've got some, some big winds here uh, west of the uh, Central Valley and east of the Central Valley out in California where, where wind farms really started and some down here in Palmdale, et cetera, I mean, uh, uh, Palm Springs, et cetera. But uh, now they're discovering that the winds here are heavier. There's heavier density of moisture. So these light uh, moisture-free winds are good but the heavy winds actually are going to produce more power per, uh, per uh, wind generator area. So here around Detroit, this whole Midwest area, we're enriched by this power. Uh, California, in its, in its progressive way, was uh, really always welcoming Fuller and a lot of energetic supporters were building his buildings. I look at this one because all this really needs is some solar panels, and which were very new at the time in 62, and, and a wind generator which hadn't been invented yet. Uh, but with those kind of components and the other elements, uh, this could have been a self-sufficient uh, building. One of the great triumphs <clears throat> in Fuller's uh, life, as he would tell us, was the invitation by uh, the United States to build the central uh, expo building, Expo 67 up in Montreal, this is one of the greatest architectural expos where so much new architecture, uh, these tent forms from the Germans were there and others that uh, set a whole new direction in what they call manufactured modular architecture. And but everybody was completely awe-inspired by the U.S. pavilion, which was Bucky's Dome. And pretty quickly after the uh, expo, Fuller did start to shift much more toward renewable energy. He saw the patterns of moving in the Middle East where, where the conflicts uh, and warfare were, were going to set a condition where the politics would, would freeze the oil. And sure enough, it happened in 73. So he was uh, really ahead of the curve, actually, before the, 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 the big uh, cartel and supporting a great group of people in Wisconsin who I've got to know and work with. A um, small town in McQuantico in southeastern Wisconsin, they were developing a very good wind generator, uh, both uh, aluminum one and then sail wing units. Bucky designed a tower for their uh, wind generator based on his triangulated tubular structures, but he didn't have time to build it. So a group of us at UIC in Chicago built the first tower and became involved with these tremendously capable guys out of a company called Windworks and uh, Hans Meyer, uh, the guy that probably invented the solid state inverter to convert DC battery power into a very efficient form of, of solar electric uh, AC. Also, we were aware of research with a guy out at uh, uh, Kansas State University who is doing very, very progressive forms of the S rotor and proving uh, against some other opinions that it had a very high efficiency, not a low efficiency. And here this uh, Gary Johnson, who has a complete book on wind power, by the way, free online, handbook, wind power on, uh, hand, wind power handbook. So, uh, excuse me, I got a flip. There we go. And uh, we have a, a direction there that was very important in my influence to show that vertical axis could win and be effective. In the meantime, a great big company called Alcoa was working on a form of wind generators called the Darius Rotor. And uh, 
this is different than what Bucky had proposed, but these were these egg beater type blades, each one an airfoil, and uh, they worked at a very good level, small level, but they had a hard time making them very big into the kind of megawatt machines the utility companies wanted. But sadly, uh, a lot of this research was pushed aside just because they couldn't be follow the paradigm of centralized power, where they would work quite effectively decentralized, a very big uh, paradigm that Fuller was always for. So here's a form that, uh, again, some California pioneers back in 76 saw the trends and began to put these on, on buildings because they wouldn't vibrate as much, they didn't spin as fast, and they're looking to do self-sufficient shelters and follow in the next steps of what Fuller had proposed. And here's a lot of sketches from that period. Some of these would appear in a, in a great publication called uh, The Whole Earth Catalog and then The Whole Earth Review. And about half of these ended up getting built. I remember going to visit this one and it was working quite well with a very simple kind of water pumping S rotor that essentially uh, performed the work of, of what a, a hand pump or a motorized pump would have to do. So uh, we began researching our own forms of uh, a vertical axis wind generator in the 80s, and, and but we saw all of the all of the support, governmental supports for small wind and small solar being removed. In fact, we had a president who took the solar panels off the White House. And we thought, oh, there's a signal. Uh, taking down solar panels, I guess there isn't going to be much room for this for a while. But we went on to do other kinds of uh, passive solar design and buildings in Chicago and kind of waited for the day when maybe uh, we'd, we'd have some stronger leadership on the renewable energy front. And as we did, we began to utilize these past experiences that would bring the Darius vertical uh, airfoil here, and then the S rotor, only now uh, in, in, a, in a continuing form, because the older S rotors would kind of end up vibrating a lot. There'd be a, a positive and a negative area of, of thrust when the wind would spin on them. So as they, they spun, they'd, they'd bust their bearings downwind. Um, so with this, this kind of approach, the helix, now the wind form actually doesn't go on and off, it moves up and down, and this machine is always showing 50% of its wind gathering area. It's never a more on and off shape. So the vibration goes away, the bearing noise goes away, and the efficiency goes way up. So here we are with one of the first ones that we ever built of all places. We're a Chicago company, but the first grant that we had to build one was in San Francisco, and that early machine from 2005 is still there. This is a picture of it. Uh, we have to change out the alternator because the alternators that we were getting from China had magnets that would rust, and now we have completely sealed alternators for the last 20 years. So you go on with your components sometimes and hold you back. But this was a geodesic steel tube frame like that tower we did for Windworks. We like Lexan and polycarbonate. You can regrind it and reuse it as a very durable and tough material. We have the Darius rotor uh, outboard, and then the, the S rotor in the helical shape inboard, and then the neodymium magnet uh, three phase alternators. These are super magnets, so powerful that if uh, workers have to wear gloves protecting their thumbs, otherwise, they, if they hold two magnets, that they can really crush their fingers if they're not careful. So those are the components that you need to move forward with these kinds of vertical axis machines that haven't been around until the, really the new alternators and electronics were available. So we also find that once you start a new paradigm, you can, you can do things with it you'd never do with a propeller. You'd never really want to put a propeller machine inside its tower. You always put it up at the top because it's got to spin around and it takes up a lot of area here. Well, we have a predictable area, uh, a, a kind of cylindrical area, so we can put it inside its own tower. And now that tower can be a structural unit and you can begin to play with those structural units in ways that nobody else did before. So here's a concept that we got close to building in India and we may get 
built yet in Africa, where you take the traditional market town center, and in these hot countries, you really want to have shade for the, the market. So a lot of them have a lot of umbrellas, or they'll have tent structures. So here's a tent structure over the market, and it's held up by our compression columns. And in the middle, we have the wind generators. So when the wind comes in, it blows around, and it tends to skim around the roof here, and, and it will animate these generators. And then we look to eventually having these roofing uh, areas of fabric uh, layered over with the new flexible solar panels uh, from a great company called Oleonics, which is just up the road in Auburn Hills, uh, invented by Stan Oshinsky, uh, uh, a favorite uh, friend of Fuller's and a tremendous inventor of the flexible solar uh, panel. So here we are putting things together that haven't been put together before. This is hybridizing. This is what Bucky did all the time. He combined things in unique uh, relationships, and uh, we move on with uh, a whole new paradigm. So here's now the tent which we've had, structures that we've had, but they have wind generators. And now tent surfaces that you can add solar panels to, so this marketplace can begin to become a whole new central electric generating station. Actually, we also can collect the monsoon waters here and store it in cisterns, part of the plan we, we, we had working with some media <coughs> architects. And uh, all along and outside the market are the commercial areas, the church, uh, the municipal buildings, all of which can begin to draw renewable energy from this central resource. And you can keep building that tent keep adding it as long as you need to, to keep doing your enterprise. So here's a completely opposite shift. Here is one of our first residential projects in Chicago. And this was quite a project working with young architects who were uh, pioneering in green architecture back in 2005. And they helped us get the first, first zoning approval for our wind generators, which were generally opposed, people didn't want the idea of a propeller in the neighborhood, but when they saw that they'd have a quiet, more interesting looking device that uh, would fit in with the neighborhood and the roof, that helped change their minds and they accepted this in their neighborhood. So uh, we also did solar. We have a long history of solar electric um, activity. So we integrated again at a new level combination of this square frame that held two of our early, uh, we call them 510 because they're five by 10 feet, 10 feet high, five feet wide, about a thousand watt uh, uh, wind generator rating. And here's 5,000 watts of rated solar. And uh, then that was all integrated within a very, very elegant green roof and outdoor viewing area these folks would sit out here in their patio and they look out here, should include this view in these other shots in the future, and you can see downtown Chicago from their roof, above the bugs, above the dust, above the noise, and this could be the future for the backyard in the city. You put it on the roof. These are unique solar panels from a great company called SunTech. They have a translucent kind of support structure. So underneath, you look up at these things, it almost looks like a grape arbor, with light coming in, down, around. It's not the leaves, but kind of the leaves, the photovoltaic cells. So you had a, a kind of diffused light that just made this roof, and it continues to make a, a really joy to be a part of it. Nice breeze this time of year. In Chicago, you really want to find a breeze. So we also studied this whole idea of coupling the design uh, between the solar and wind. The winds uh, will go down in the, in the summer and up in the, up in the winter. And then if you can combine them, you can get kind of an average of renewable energy that would be a uh, tremendously more predictable annual uh, production. Here's extensions of our ideas of the combinations. Here's a greenhouse idea. Uh, a guy named Chris Belknap, a tremendous architect out in California, and his idea for a self-sufficient food and energy producing machine, this greenhouse, that has uh, airborne or aero uh, 
uh, plants that are fed by sprays, and then uh, solar and wind all on one structure. And these are the kinds of buildings we're looking to the future. We're proposing megawatt roofs. If you have 200,000 square foot building roofs, you can get a million watts of solar and wind and uh, start to be a little power plant. Here's some of the structures like that we built in Chicago at the PepsiCo building. And uh, you can see these at Monroe and Jefferson working away. And uh, these have been one of our more successful projects. And we hope to continue uh, working with PepsiCo in future projects. Here's what they look like when they're raw in the uh, factory before they get out and get going. Here's some conceptual things where we can put our wind generators on geodesic domes and uh, bring Fuller's older ideas together with new ones, keeping the hybrid idea going. And we propose this for some buildings in Haiti because Haiti suffers two areas, hurricanes as well as earthquakes. And here we have a, uh, uh, a building that will do both. And so solutions for London that could combine solar and wind. And here's from Gensler uh, Architects, uh, engineering architects would love to combine our wind generators on corners of buildings because the winds will hit the building and, and turbulate and, and spin right into the wind generators for, for power. Okay, I'm in the last two slides. Uh, here's one of Fuller's uh, best uh, disciples, uh, Norman Foster, and his plan for a 1,700-foot uh, tower, all of which would embrace solar and wind, and would to be a, a whole community built in. And then we also look to the day where Fuller's floating cities, his nine, uh, his cloud nine structures, these were ideas for domes that were so light they'd be like a balloon, and how we could animate them and support them with solar and wind. Imagine if we had our wind generators stuck on these different nodes, covered the rest with solar. Now you have something that could be a revolutionary uh, artificial moon for either Earth or other planets. Thank you so much.